Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out. My name is Kyle Sellner. I'm a co-director of the Center for the Dale Center for the Study of War and Society, and the chair of the History Department here at uh, Southern Miss. I'm pleased to be co-organizing tonight this year's lecture series with uh, my colleague, Dr. Joshua Haynes, in the back there. We are delighted that you came out uh, to join us for the second lecture of this year's series on indigenous warfare in early North America. Uh, before we get too far introductions, uh, into the introductions, I would like you to turn off your cell phones or just check your cell phones. Um, I better do that. Nothing <laughs> ruins, uh, you know, the, the atmosphere of early America like a cell phone. <laughs> First, I want to thank our donors uh, for this wonderful series, uh, Drs. Richard McCarthy and Craig Howard for their generous support of the Dale Center in general, but specifically this lecture series. Um, Mac, who is here in the back. Um, and Craig have been with us almost from the very beginning, and we're now on our 13th year of bringing amazing scholars to Hattiesburg to talk about war and society, and it's a, it's a really special series, so we're very happy to be associated with it. Um, we've actually had many great series over the years, and I just wanted to point out um, <coughs> that we actually have several of them on the Dale Center website, or our YouTube channel. You can actually go to the YouTube channel for the, for the Center, and watch some of our older uh, lectures and and, uh, uh, and take a look and see what's what's out there for uh, for your viewing pleasure. Um, I also want to point out that we have one more lecture in the series for this year um, on Tuesday, February 27th, also at 6 p.m. Uh, our very own Dr. Joshua Haynes will be talking about uh, his scholarship and his soon-to-be-released book, Patrolling the Border: Theft and Violence on the Creek, Georgia frontier, 1770 to 1796. Uh, and Josh reminded me the book is coming out in May, and it's already available on Amazon for pre-order. Um, so, and apparently I get a small cut if a lot of that, if the, the sales rank goes up tonight. So um, you might want to think about that. If you'd like more information about the McCarthy Lecture Series or the Dale Center in general and our events, we have some brochures over here and also a way uh, to sign up for our mailing list, and there's even a way to donate to the center so that we can continue to support more events like this, uh, and we would be appreciative of you doing that. So our speaker this evening is Dr. David Silverman, uh, professor of history at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., where he specializes in Native American and colonial American history and also American racial history. I first met David when we were both graduate students at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, uh, where we both survived Professor Jim Axtell's famous, or may I say infamous, seminar on colonial American history and Native American history. Um, there was cod liver oil and salt cod involved with that experience that the graduate students were made to try to live history, and I think that's probably enough. It was like 10 in the morning. It was awful. <laughs> he heated the cod liver oil in the, in the microwave in the department, and the department yeah. reached for like a week. Okay. But we got the experience of early America and early oh. Canada through that. Through that. Uh, uh, Dr. Silverman received a master's from William and Mary and also a master's and PhD from Princeton where he worked with the noted colonial uh, historian John Murin. Uh, he taught at Princeton and Wayne State uh, University in Detroit for a while and then moved to George Washington in 2003. Uh, his scholarship has won major awards from the Alma Hunter Institute of Early American History and Culture in Williamsburg and the New York Association of History. Uh, he has made numerous media appearances, including on PBS, uh, <coughs> OVA, on the History Channel, and even on CNN with Wolf Blitzer, no less. I, I There's a story behind that. I'll okay. tell you later. <laughs> that will be uh, David has written uh, and edited seven books, in addition to numerous articles and book chapters. Two of my favorite, I couldn't read them all, but two of my favorite, is, uh, his first book was called Faith and Boundaries, Colonists, Christianity and Community Among Wampanoag Indians on Martha's Vineyard, 1600 to 1871, a book our graduate students know very well. It's, I, I always assign it, and it's on their reading list. Uh, and, and also Red Brethren, The Brother Town in Stockbridge Indians and the Problem of Race in Early America. He is currently writing a Wampanoag-centered history of Plymouth, and the Thanksgiving holiday for Bloomsbury Press. And tonight he's, he's going to speak to us about his most recent book, which came out in 2016 from Belknap Press of Harvard University Press, Thundersticks, Firearms, and the Violent Transformation of Native Americans. So please welcome David Silverman. 
Well, thanks, everybody. Um, this isn't only my first uh, trip to USM. It's my first trip ever to Mississippi. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm glad this is the occasion for it. Uh, everyone's been um, wonderfully hospitable, true to reputation. Um, and so thanks for the, uh, the warm welcome. Uh, before I begin, um, I should note I've been uh, giving talks on this book since it was released in um, October, I think, of 2016 can't remember exactly how many, let's say 20 or so. Um, and I, I think I would be derelict uh, as a public historian and as a citizen if I didn't note that um, I've forgotten how many of those talks have overlapped with mass shootings. I can't remember anymore. It's happened too much. Um, in schools, and nightclubs, and at concerts, and many other places with semi-automatic assault weapons that are purchased legally. Um, and it's a fraught exercise to try to predict how future historians will judge our society, but I feel certain about this one. They're going to judge us harshly on this one. You bet. All right. So with that. So when the, the famed Lakota warriors, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, turn themselves into American authorities to begin life on the reservation, both of them symbolized this transition by handing over their firearms. Crazy Horse's time came on May 6th, 1877, following a, qu a quarter century of Lakota resistance to United States hegemony. In a scene captured here by the famous 19th century magazine, Harper's, uh, Harper's, uh, uh, sorry, this isn't Harper's, this is Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, but Harper's was on the scene too. And uh, after leading 200 warriors, their families, and thousands of horses to Camp Robinson, an American military outpost at the southwest doorway to the Great Sioux Reservation, Crazy Horse sent a delegate to ask the commanding officer, Lieutenant William P. Clark, for permission, and newspapers on the scene recorded this conversation, for permission to surrender their arms at the agency voluntarily and not have them forcibly taken away from them. Crazy Horse's reasoning here was that, and I quote again, neither he nor his warriors were defeated or cowed into submission, but that he deemed it best as a matter of policy to surrender. In other words, you didn't make us do this. We chose to do this. Well, hours later, after the people had erected their teepees and refreshed themselves, the men gathered in the center of camp to fulfill this promise. First Crazy Horse, then other chiefs, such as Little Big Man, He Dog, and Little Hawk, and finally, 50 more men of lesser rank placed 147 guns in a pile. Most of them, according to newspaper reports, First-rate sporting rifles, or else Springfield carbines, caliber 45, the same as now issued to United States troops. Such weapons appear here. Crazy Horse himself relinquished three fine Winchester rifles, according to these reports. And the Winchester rifle was a repeating gun that held between 10 and 14 rounds. Well, when Lieutenant Clark complained that this certainly was not the entire arsenal of Crazy Horse's band, an additional 50 rifles and muskets and 31 pistols surfaced. Uh, probably still less than the total, uh, but enough to satisfy the lieutenant for the meantime. I share this anecdote with you because clearly a lack of weapons had nothing to do with the capitulation of the Lakotas to the Americans. Crazy Horse's senior tribesman, Sitting Bull, had always said he'd rather hunt prairie mice than become a farmer. And yet, after leading his followers into Blackfeet country, north of the U.S.-Canada border to escape the American cavalry, he discovered that the Plains Indian way of life was becoming impossible there too, because of the decimation of the bison herd and opposition from Canadian Mounties. Thus, when Sitting Bull turned himself in at Fort Buford, Montana, on July 19, 1882, he understood this was a watershed akin to his ancestors' decision more than two centuries earlier to mount the horse and ride onto the plains as bison hunters. <laughs> 
This time, however, the future held far less promise. His people would have to give up their warfare, their hunting, and their independence, all indelibly tied to the gun to become peaceful farmers under American rule. There was no worth in this for a Lakota warrior. It was life without living, which Sitting Bull symbolized by refusing to hand over his weapon himself. Instead, he appointed his son, Crowfoot, to perform the deed, thus preserving his own honor while acknowledging that his posterity would have to follow the new path. And this is what we think his rifle was. However, unlike Crazy Horse, who maintained a dignified silence at his capitulation, Sitting Bull characteristically marked the occasion with eloquence. And please bear with me, I want to share his, uh, his talk with you. I surrender this rifle to you through my young son, whom I now desire to teach in the manner that he has become a friend to, of the Americans. I wish him to learn the habits of the whites and be educated as their sons are educated. I wish it to be remembered that I was the last man of my tribe to surrender my rifle. The boy has given it to you, and he wants to know now, how is he going to make a living? The Lakotas admired Sitting Bull as a clairvoyant as well as a warrior, but even he was incapable of answering this dreaded question. The ceremonialism of Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull at the time of their surrenders captures a lesson that's too often been lost and even denied in accounts of American Indian history. From the early days of Atlantic coast colonization through the end of the Plains Wars in the late 19th century, one group of Indians after another used firearms to revolutionize their lives. And I'm trying to capture that theme here by showing you two different groups of native people from opposite ends of the continent, separated by, by a century, both bearing arms. The first groups to adopt these weapons sought a military advantage over their rivals. Those who managed to seize temporary control of an emerging gun market transformed themselves into predatory gunmen, terrorizing entire regions in search of captives, plunder, land, and glory. The cycle began in the 1630s, when the Five Nations Iroquois built an arsenal of Dutch muskets and became a military force that struck native peoples across the entire breadth of eastern North America, mostly for the purpose of, of obtaining captives for adoption. And here you see one such captive being led to that fate. Not until other native groups caught up in the regional arms race and returned the punishment would the violence finally subside after decades of tumult and innumerable lives lost. Gun violence also erupted across the southeast between 1680 and 1720, and I imagine you heard something about this when Robbie Etheridge visited um, a, a bit ago. English South Carolina's demand for Indian slaves and its willingness to pay for them in munitions spurred a rise of a series of militant slaving nations, some of them pictured here, including the Westos, the Savannas, the Amasees, the Creeks, and the Chickasaws. Their raids netted upwards of 50,000 captives over the life of the trade, practically emptied the Florida Peninsula of native people, and produced a Hobbesian environment in which one could either go slaving for arms or become enslaved to better armed raiders. It's a pattern, I should note parenthetically, that was also unfolding at the same time in West Africa, albeit on a much grander scale. As the gun market spread across the continent, similar patterns played out region after region. The Osages, for example, used their control of the French, Spanish, and then American gun trade out of St. Louis to dominate the middle Mississippi River Valley during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. In the 1790s, Chief McQuana of the Nootchalnuts, or Nootkas, of Vancouver Island in the Pacific Northwest, turned his role as the point man in the traffic of British and American arms 
to raid and trade for slaves over a coastal range of some 300 miles. He also forced a growing roster of communities to pay him tribute in otter pelts, which he then traded for more arms. Likewise, the Blackfeet became the scourge of the northern plains and Rocky Mountain West by combining the might of guns and horses. The former supplied by the Hudson's Bay and Northwest companies, the latter acquired through raid and trade with natives to the Southwest. For decades, the Blackfeet jealously guarded their advantage by stationing gunmen at passes through the Rocky Mountains to keep their rivals to the west and the gun merchants to the east apart. What we, we see through all of these examples, which I develop in separate chapters, is that differential access to guns became a key determinant in the rise of some native peoples and the vulnerability of others to captivity, enslavement, dispossession, horse raiding, and death. The result was the serial eruption of regional arms races across the continent <coughs> between 1630 and 1870. Most native people participated in these arms races well before the advent of repeating rifles and pistols in the mid to late 19th century. For the better part of 200 years, the technology remained the same. The weapon of choice was the smoothbore muzzle-loading flintlock musket, such as the one pictured here. This, is, uh, this by the way, is, to my knowledge, the only um, uh, uh, existing Dutch-era uh, trade musket uh, from the 17th century. Now, scholarship is sometimes too quick to dismiss these early modern shoulder weapons as crude and ineffective, and to assume that Indians got the worst of the lot. Uh, one of the reasons I wrote this book is that I encountered these statements so many times without any citations um, that I felt that the question had to be asked. Well, I'm arguing to the contrary. Indians used these guns to devastating effect, both in short-range ambushes, which was their most common tactic, but also in sieges of fortified settlements. Additionally, Indian economic and political influence, including their ability to choose, between rival colonial suppliers consistently enabled them to get the very best of European firearms technology manufactured to their tastes. Now by all counts, native people learned to use these weapons better than the people of the societies that manufactured them. I'll give you an anecdote from a, a, a local um, a, a local episode to illustrate the point. So at the 1736 Battle of Accia, in what's now Mississippi, Chickasaw gunmen, such as the ones uh, pictured here, redirected their fire at the legs of attacking French soldiers after realizing that the French were wearing bullet-resistant wool packs on their chests. So again, they can only target the Frenchman's legs. Their marksmanship inflicted casualties on 100 of the 130 French soldiers. Leading Louisiana Governor Jean-Baptiste Sir Lemoyne de Bienville to exclaim, the Chickasaws have the advantage of shooting more accurately than perhaps any other nation. At least more accurately than the French. To men too many historians, regardless of such cases, and they're innumerable, casually assert that Indians valued slow-loading hard to maintain muskets over perfectly serviceable bows and arrows because of the gun's so-called psychological effect. You see that term over and over again. And psychological effect uh, refers to the terror produced by the weapon's loud combustion, flash, and smoke. No. Indians adopted firearms because hard experience taught them that lethal wounds followed the pyrotechnics of gunfire, and that warriors outfitted with guns routinely trounced poorly armed rivals. Look, no doubt, being shot at is terrifying. And the first time one encounters um, the combustion of one of, these, uh, uh, one of these muskets, it must have been startling. But how many times does it take before the effect wears off? Not too many, uh, is my guess. Now, for many natives, the gun became a, an important and even necessary tool for hunting. This is one of my favorite illustrations um, from this period. It's also 
from uh, the local area, from the south uh, southern Mississippi River Valley. Um, what you see is a native hunter uh, trying to disguise himself as a deer to sneak up on his, uh, his prey. So, you know, this pattern of native people using their muskets for hunting was especially true among the deer hunters east of the Mississippi and uh, caribou and moose hunters near Hudson Bay. It took only a generation or two before native people claimed that their young folks had become so accustomed to hunting with these weapons and so out of practice at using and manufacturing bows and arrows that they would starve without ammunition and gunsmithing. And most historians, I think, are skeptical of these, these claims, believing that they were a negotiating tactic to get more favorable prices or gifts or what have you. But such statements are often corroborated by the archaeological record. Um, an arche there's archaeological record of Indians hunting game with firearms, coterminous with a decline in arrowhead production. So we could see that in the archaeological record. On the plains, only a minority of Indians hunted bison with muzzle-loading muskets. Uh, one such exception appears here. And there's a number of reasons for this. For one, muzzle loaders were difficult to handle on horseback. Uh, but furthermore, the, the sound of the shot risked sending a buffalo herd into a stampede before the other hunters were ready to strike. You don't want that. Uh, finally, and not least of all, Plains Indians, and so there's a cultural factor here. Plains Indians wanted to receive personal credit for their kills, which was possible with individually marked arrows, but impossible with, with gunshot. Nevertheless, in the 1860s, Plains hunters avidly uh, uh, employed breech loaders, repeating rifles, and six-shooter pistols in the chase because their technological advantages over the bow and arrow or the spear uh, were just too great to resist. And I think the, the fact that so many different indigenous peoples used guns in their hunting is testament to their confidence in the efficacy of these weapons. Because the hunter's purpose certainly wasn't to induce a psychological effect in their prey. The centrality of guns to native warfare and hunting made them symbols of Indian manhood, for these were the most basic male responsibilities. Almost any man who aspired to social esteem, a favorable marriage, or political influence first had to prove himself as a warrior and a hunter. Well, as the arms market spread, achieving this kind of status required him to become a capable gunman as well. Guns grew so essential to masculine achievement that in many times and places, an Indian man was rarely, if ever, seen abroad without a musket and ammunition bag slung over his shoulder, as you see here. And Europeans comment on, on this pattern at length. He even carried these items to the afterlife. During the 17th century, Native people throughout the eastern woodlands began burying adult males with munitions among other gender-specific grave goods. Among the Blackfeet, capturing an enemy warrior's gun became the greatest honor a man could accomplish in battle, which he then memorialized in ceremony and art. Indeed, the, the, the Blackfeet word for war honor translates as captures a gun. Learning to make basic gun repairs and mold lead shot never mind shooting guns accurately, joined the list of things a native man needed to know by simple virtue of being a man. So in short, Indians turned firearms into a constituent part of manhood as they conceived of it, and by extension, basic to the good and the ill men brought to the people around them. This is one of my, the, my favorite items um, that I encountered in the course of my research. So one of the things that I did as part of my research was visited museums with robust historical era uh, Indian gun collections. And one of the problems that I encountered is most of these museums wanted ideal types that were you know, polished, they were undamaged, there was no marks on them. That's the exact opposite of what I wanted. I wanted to see guns that had been used. I wanted to know how they were used, how they were repaired, how they were decorated. And what you see here is a Blackfeet musket um, from the Glenbow Museum, wonderful museum in, uh, in uh, Calgary, Alberta, um, in which native people have manipulated this, uh, this tool 
a number of times over the course of, of its use. They shortened the barrel, um, they attached um, uh, the barrel to the stock using a piece of rawhide. Um, somebody actually carved a sight um, into, uh, into the musket. Other, other such guns um, that you, uh, you encounter um, uh, at places like the Muse Museum of the Fur Trade in Shadron, Nebraska. This is one of the most remote museums I've ever been to. Go there. It's, it's just fantastic. Um, you'll see they decorate these guns in all kinds of uh, uh, personal ways. Um, and uh, you know, some of their, uh, their repairs are downright ingenious. Um, and I should note here, a number of uh, uh, people ask me over the course of these talks, well, uh, you know, uh, did Native people ever practice blacksmithing? You know, or, or could they ever manufacture their own guns? I know of two cases of Native people who picked up blacksmithing, both of them from 17th century New England. That's it. Um, for reasons that I'll explain um, in a little bit. Um, and they never had the kind of manufacturing capacity to mine um, and, and produce uh, all the various parts that uh, are required for, uh, for these guns. They do, however, learn how to basically maintain them, right? You know, to straighten out barrels, uh, to re uh, repair firing mechanisms with, uh, when they need to, and as you see here, you know, reattach uh, barrels to um, the stocks of the guns. So those are things that men needed to know. I think it's also telling of the role that guns came to play in Indian constructions of gender that Native women rarely used firearms, even when their lives were in peril. So anyway, so this is, this is gaining, a, graduate students, this is a way that you can uh, 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 gain a conclusion from negative evidence. Right? It's telling that women did not use, uh, use these guns. Now, and there's, there are reasons for this. Um, Indians widely, and the, this is, is almost universal, widely held that women were meant by the spirits to give and sustain life, but not take it. That's the role of men. Uh, women bear children, they, they, they cook, um, they, they uh, sustain the family. And I, what I see is that this principle held firm, even when the threat of enemy gunmen was imminent, and the community at risk had enough resources to put firearms in the hands of adults of both sexes. They never did. It didn't seem to matter that women faced special dangers from enemy raiders and armies, uh, insofar as uh, Indian war parties usually killed their adult male opponents, whereas they tended uh, to mark able-bodied women for forcible adoption and slavery. Now, let me be clear. Um, some groups permitted biological females who identified as a gender variant to spirit to join men on hunting expeditions. Um, and by the way, undergraduates love the two spirits. I actually think there are more senior theses written about two spirits than there were two spirits. Um, uh, but they're interesting. Yeah, there's no getting around it. There's also about six lines of evidence relating to them total, uh, as far as I'm, I'm able to tell. Um, but it, these figures were so rare as to prove the rule that Native women didn't handle guns. What women did do, though, is draw on their expertise in leatherworking, sewing, and beadwork to produce the gun bags, ammunition pouches, and war shirts so central to the material culture of firearms. And so what I'm suggesting here is that overall, Indian gun use reinforced conventional definitions of masculinity and femininity. Um, what you're seeing here is a, uh, a Blackfeet gun case, and below, a war shirt. So a, a great warrior would have uh, a war shirt uh, sewn for him by his wife. Um, it would be decorated with the scalps of his enemies, and then his, um, his war exploits would be painted on the shirt. And here, um, I will demonstrate. So these would be people he killed. These would be weapons that he captured from the enemy. And look what's in the middle. That's what he's most proud of. So as Indians' need for munitions grew, they developed political economies to ensure their people's supply of arms and gunsmithing services and restrict their rivals' access to such essential things. Repeatedly, Indian polities cultivated arms trade with multiple sources to ensure dependable flows of munitions at low costs, even in the event of war with the societies of those suppliers. Now, sometimes the arms dealers hailed from different nations, such as England, France, the Netherlands, or Spain, or different colonies of the same nation, 
Um, the English provinces of the Atlantic seaboard are a great example. If you were, if you were native people living on Long Island Sound, um, so for those of you, I know we're in Mississippi, so I realize that Long Island Sound might not be all that familiar. Um, you know, what you have is uh, you have Dutch New Netherland on the Hudson River here. You have Dutch communities on Western Long Island. You have English communities loosely affiliated with Connecticut on Eastern Long Island. You have Connecticut to due north. You have Rhode Island um, to the east and easy access also to Massachusetts. Um, all, of, all of these colonies can be played off of each other so that native people can get the most favorable rates, the most favorable deals. Um, in other times and places, munitions came from native people from one or more groups of native people playing the role of middleman between colonial markets and Indians of the interior. Uh, this is the only such uh, illustration of this kind of commerce of which I'm, I'm aware. Middlemen of this sort, so again, native people who are taking arms from colonial markets and then bringing them deep into Indian country and selling them to other native people there included the Wichita's of uh, what's now Oklahoma um, the Crees and Assiniboines of the North Central Plains, um, and the, Cree, their, the Crees and Assiniboines are especially fascinating. Um, for decades, they ferried arms all the way from Hudson Bay, deep into the interior of the continent, um, into the, the North Central Plains and, um, and the Rocky Mountain West, and became the main suppliers for the Blackfeet for uh, quite a long time. The point of cultivating so many different trade partners was to prevent foreigners from turning the people's dependence on firearms into political and economic weakness. As you can imagine, Indian polities used their commercial and military leverage to shape these relationships to their advantage. They adjusted their economies to produce the beaver pelts, the deerskins, the bison robes, the pemmican, the otter pelts and the slaves coveted by arms dealers. And they used their arms against rivals to acquire the slaves and the hunting grounds for more production. They warned gun dealers that they would take their trade elsewhere unless they received gunsmithing, powder, and shot at reduced prices or even for free. Um, young people, you won't understand what I'm talking about. Older people were. You might remember that Xerox um, uh, would give you the machine so that you kept on buying the, uh, the ink. It's, it's not, un, not unlike that. Um, they, threatened merchant, uh, they threatened their merchants uh, who did business with them. Don't you dare supply our rivals. In the early 1800s, for example, the Blackfeet warned the Hudson's Bay and Northwest companies um, that they would, and I quote, intercept any white man who might attempt to convey goods to the flatheads. Uh, Blackfeet enemies on the uh, west side of the Rocky Mountains. Well, as for what they would do next, they threatened, if they again meet with a white man going to supply their enemies, they would not only plunder and kill him, but make dry meat of his body. I don't need to elaborate. Um, and no one in these companies doubted their word. Traders who bent to these demands very often found themselves with customers so loyal that they could be trusted to repay large extensions of credit. Pause on that. They trust these native people to repay large extensions of credit even in the absence of formal legal mechanisms to enforce these agreements. Sounds to me like a great dissertation topic. Those who ignored the Indians' conditions suffered a loss of business, at best, and sometimes the loss of their lives. These kinds of tactics were basic to the intertribal, and Indian colonial weapons economy throughout its lengthy history. I contend that the widespread success of Indians at building and maintaining large arsenals of firearms also reveals the high degree of interdependence between Indians and Euro-Americans. So again, I'm contending that they become dependent on firearms, but that a relation of interdependence develops between Native people and, and Euro-Americans. And this interdependence stemmed from a number of factors. For one, Indians were the main suppliers of the colonies beaver and otter pelts, deer skins, and buffalo robes. We too often forget the fur trade was big business in nearly every colony in its opening decades, and in some cases throughout its whole existence, as in New Netherland. Look at the seal. There's a beaver in the middle. <laughs> 
and there's a ring of, uh, these are wampum beads that would be produced by native people. New Netherlands entire economy depends on native people. Also applies to new, the oft forgotten New Sweden on the lower Delaware, uh, New France, Russia and Alaska. Numerous colonial and early national economies, um, or rather communities, were founded on this trade. Montreal, Detroit, Springfield, Massachusetts, Albany, New York, Savannah, St. Louis, Edmonton, I could go on and on. Some fur trade enterprises, like the Hudson's Bay and American uh, Fur Company, um, companies, which you, know, you see a map of their posts here, they had influence in the upper ranks of colonial and imperial government. What I'm suggesting here is that Indians sold valuable resources to weighty interests. And what they insisted on receiving in exchange, above all else, were high quality, low cost firearms, gunpowder, shot, and gunsmithing. Now let's be clear. Indians demanded other types of goods too. Uh, woolen blankets, linen, shirts, metal tools, uh, liquor. And indeed, uh, you know, in terms of volume and monetary value, as Europeans calculate it, um, cloth and clothing makes up a larger portion of this trade than munitions. But here's the point. Native people could make do without manufactured cloth, non-military non tools, and alcohol if they had to do so. They didn't want to, but they could. Guns and ammunition were military necessities. They were the only types of trade goods that were an actual matter of life and death. And so the Indians' Euro-American trade partners could supply these wares at reasonable cost or lose their native customers and risk turning them into enemies. Colonial and imperial authorities, knowing all too well about the high cost of warring against Indians, responded by making gifts of munitions and gunsmithing a routine part of their diplomacy with them. Oftentimes, presence of these goods and services were so common that powerful Indian groups no longer had to pay for them to any significant degree. Um, this would include the Southeast in the early to mid 18th century, when South Carolina, Georgia, French Louisiana, and Spanish Florida were all competing for the favor of the Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaws, and Chickasaws. The amount of munitions that these gr and guns that these groups receive for free is, is astounding. Uh, the same held true for the Blackfeet in the 1830s and 40s, when American firms on the Missouri and British Canadian firms on the Saskatchewan rivers vied for their business. So let me reiterate here. Indians might have grown dependent on firearms, but their dependence on the technology of Europe didn't render them politically subservient to particular empires, colonies, or nations. Indian colonial interdependence and Indians' cultivation of multiple sources of supply ensured as much. Colonial states were never able to exploit the Indians' need for munitions to force them to cede their land or extradite their people to colonial justice. What those states could do with varying degrees of effectiveness was reduce but rarely halt the arms trade during periods of Indian colonial warfare, and thereby pressure Indians to end their campaigns. Let me emphasize, though, there were always traders who refused to abide by these restrictions, even at the risk of capital punishment. Most alarming were examples of government officials and military men who turned to the black market trade with Indians to line their own pockets. Uh, the officers, the Dutch officers of New Netherland were no notorious in this regard. Um, again, it was, it, you could be capitally punished for trading arms to Indians in New Netherland, and they all seem to be doing it. Um, I should point out, too, there are plenty of examples from the United States during the Plains Wars of, of, native, of, of military men who are trading arms to the very same native people that they're warring against. And I argue that this pattern should serve as one of the prime examples of what the anthropologist Shannon Lee Doughty has called rogue colonialism in which colonists from all ranks pursued their own gains, often illegally, in opposition to the directives of central authorities and even against the security of their own neighbors. Government could seem fictional when it was incapable of preventing its own people from arming their enemies. <laughs>
Now, colonists were most effective, and I think this is a, a critical point. Colonists were most effective at cutting off Indian opponents from munitions when they enlisted the help of Indian allies, largely by plying them with arms. Uh, the best example, I think, comes during King Philip's War of 1675-76, the great contest for southern New England. Um, in that contest, the formidable Mohawks, the easternmost nation of the Iroquois League, threw their, su their support to the English side because they didn't want to alienate the young English colony of New York, which had just succeeded Dutch New Netherland as their main supplier of firearms. Uh, for those of you who don't know this history, uh, the English uh, uh, conquer New Netherland in 1664 um, and take over that trade. Furthermore, the governor of New York, Edmund Andros, encouraged the Mohawks with a large present of, of muskets and ammunition and promises of much more. The Mohawks' role included driving the warring Indians, as you see um, at the top corner of this map, driving the warring Indians away from Dutch and French arms suppliers in and around Albany, uh, which the Dutch still controlled population-wise. And I argue that's the critical turning point of the conflict, Mohawk intervention um, against the warring Indians. Now, despite rare cases like these, most indigenous people, such as the Seminoles pictured here, remained well-armed right up to the very moment of their subjugation to Euro-American authority. In many instances, they wielded better guns and were better shots than the colonial forces that confronted them. The Indians' dependence on firearms never prevented them from rising up against colonial forces, and supply shortages didn't determine the vast majority of their anti-colonial wars. Another such example appears in this illustration. Instead, the most common element in the sequential collapse of Indian military resistance was war weariness, stemming from the enemy's scorched earth tactics and killing of non-combatants. Again, another key factor was their harassment at the hands of other indigenous people, most of them settling intertribal scores. To the extent that colonies tended to win wars against Indians, it was usually by enlisting other Indians uh, on their side. More generally, Indians lost a numbers game, with their own ranks thinned by repeated bouts of epidemic disease and warfare, while Euro-Americans were strengthened by high birth rates and immigration. In other words, Native people got swarmed. To the extent that Indians held back this tide, it was in no small part because of not despite of their adoption of firearms. And so my book follows what might be called the gun frontier or the opening of indigenous markets to the gun trade as it spread throughout North America. On several occasions in the book, I paused to examine how native groups faced the challenge of warring against the same colonial and imperial forces that supplied the bulk of their arms. Now certainly, the Atlantic coast was the strongest base for this trade. Um, and in broad strokes, this gun frontier tended to move from east to west, like our traditional notions of the frontier. But let me emphasize, firearms arrived in Indian country from multiple directions, along the twisting routes of rivers and ancient pathways. Throughout the 18th century, arms flowed south from Hudson Bay in the Canadian subarctic to the northern plains and Rocky Mountains. Weapons unloaded at French ports on the Gulf of Mexico, circulated north, west, and sometimes east, often for hundreds of miles. In a striking reversal of the east to west movement that we associate with the traditional frontier, during the late 18th and the early 19th centuries, Bostonian and British shipboard traders sold munitions by the boatload, and I do mean by the boatload, to indigenous peoples along the Pacific Northwest coast, who then carried these weapons eastward to native peoples of the interior. You might wonder, why did they do that? Because they don't live there. Uh, they were these, uh, these shipboard traders, they dump the munitions, they get the otter pelts, they take the otter pelts to China and clean up there uh, by selling the, the otter pelts for silks, porcelains, teas, um, and the like. Until the early to mid 19th century, most Indians in the continental Southwest, most notably the Comanches, obtained their munitions from the Wichitas of the Arkansas and Red River Valleys, who in turn 
had obtained them from French, British, and American sources on the Mississippi. By calling attention to the multivalence of where, when, and how firearms entered parts, uh, parts of Native America, this term of mind, gun frontier, seeks to highlight the complexity of indigenous people's experiences with colonialism. So I want to close on this note. My history of guns in Indian country demonstrates how indigenous people used firearms to reshape their world over the span of more than two centuries. I argue that this development represents one of the most essential features of their history with colonialism. Some natives, for greater or lesser periods of time, used guns to accumulate wealth, power, and honors, which is to say, to become ascendant. Such stories of groups like the Iroquois, the Chickasaws, the Osages, the Blackfeet, and the Clinkets offer an important counterpoint to our long-standing assumption that First Nations generally plunged into a downward trajectory of death, loss, and impoverishment right at the moment of contact with Euro-Americans. I challenge the notion that a disadvantage in arms somehow accounts for indigenous people's ultimate subjugation to Euro-American authority. Native economic power, business sense, and political savvy ensured that was not the case. However, and I think as this image graphically illustrates, it's e equally critical to note that gun-toting Indians nearly always arose at the expense of other natives, sometimes many others. And so, just as the story of the United States shouldn't be told simply as the triumphant rise of a democratic nation of liberty-loving people, neither should the advantages Indians wrested from colonialism overshadow the very real costs. I think that capturing the full range of native experiences with firearms helps us to grasp the dynamism and the darkness of colonial America viewed from Indian country. Thanks. Thanks. We have time for some questions. I'd like to offer a compliment. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> the young doctor has lavished on us a marvelous historic study. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. So, um, obviously, there were cases where they're using the Indians or making alliances with each other, yep. with, the, uh, with the Americans, with the colonists. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these other colonial scenarios around the world the colonial power then makes use of indigenous peoples or yep. partial races. That's right. Are, these, are, are the Americans doing this as well? Like special contingents? Uh, Indians? Or is it more along tribal lines? Yes. I mean, yes, they're, they're, they're making alliances with native people against native people. Yeah, but, but are, they, are they putting special contingents of natives into their own armies? Oh, uh, not absorbed into their own ranks, but usually as special forces, um, as scouts, um, as shock troops and, and the like, uh, but not, not as, as drilled members integrated into their own units. Yeah, nothing like Gurkhas and the, the Chinese. Nothing of the sort. Like nope, nothing of the sort. But I, I, I do think it's important for me, I, I, I should raise a point here, um, uh, particularly for uh, the younger, younger students here. You know, very often students say, how could Indians do this to other Indians? And my usual answer is, they weren't doing this to other Indians. They had no conception of themselves as Indians or those people as fellow Indians. It's like us shaming um, the Europeans in this case for treating Indians, their fellow Americans, the way they did. Well, later on, in, in the passage of time, they'll be fellow Americans, but they weren't then. Um, it's like shaming um, uh, peoples in Africa for enslaving other Africans. There were no Africans. Africa didn't exist. It's a figment of the European imagination. It didn't mean anything to the people on the ground. They had ethnic and tribal identities that were the, the, the base of who they were, right? And um, these, these other people that they're exploiting are enemy others. Well, and I, and I think if I can follow up on that, I think it's key to look at the agency that you bring out. Because the Chinese do the same thing, but then the natives, because they're assimilating these Aboriginal peoples, but they're using the Chinese against their old rivals. I mean, they've hated these guys for 100 That's years. That's exactly right. 200 years. Yep. Why don't I ally with 
I mean, what's remarkable is yeah, even when you're getting right up to the eve of these groups being forced on the reservations, and they, and they know that that's the policy of the United States, they are still, still um, most concerned with their intertribal rivalries. And, and very often, one of the, uh, it's one of the interesting features of the early reservation period is the United States attempt to keep them from continuing these, these uh, back and forth conflicts from those confines. Um, uh, your uh, historiographical allusions to African history are really apt, and I'm really struck by, uh, which is my specialty, uh, the parallels that, and I wrote down, in fact, noted eight different ones. Yep. One really good example in using the language that I'm learning from this uh, Native American historiography, a coalescent society in the yes. mid-17th century, which mm -hmm. became a militarized slave society. That's Robbie Etheridge. And yeah. so uh, they're called the Aero, uh, Eastern Nigeria, and in the end they dominated what became one of the mm -hmm. largest uh, parts right. of the uh, transatlantic slave trade. But their uh, central image uh, or symbol of their society is a Dane gun. Uh -huh. uh, not a Dutch flintlock, but a blunderbuss. Uh -huh. um, and so this, the role of guns in the slave trade has been well studied uh, in particular areas. But I really like your continental approach. I think there are really interesting parallels for understanding um, African history in the era of the slave trade to the eve of colonialism, the same kind of time frame that you're working with. Uh, early 17th to mid 19th century. And I just really uh, thank you because uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff. Well, look, look, sort of in other parts of the world. I think one of the areas that the colonial field needs to go is uh, fulfill the promise of Atlantic, the unfulfilled promise of Atlantic history to start putting uh, Western Africa and Eastern uh, and the Eastern Americas in conversation with each other. Very few people do that uh, because, you know, our historiography is still fundamental, our, our historical scholarship is still oriented towards the nation state, right? Uh, the colonial America is supposed to be uh, the prelude to the United States, but that, you know, no one knew it was coming, right? They, they don't function in, in that framework uh, at, at the time. Um, and I, I think by putting those two continents in conversation, you can learn an awful lot about the forces of colonialism as they work in tribal societies of, of various kinds uh, ar around the world. Um, you know, we have, we've seen, um, all, you know, in, in studies, say, of, of the fur trade or the ivory trade um, uh, or what have you, that when um, tribal peoples who have normally saw, seen the natural world in terms of resources, not commodities, when they get tied in to an international market economy of hundreds of thousands or even millions of nameless, faceless people, they will exploit those natural resources as quickly as they can to gain a, a, an advantage over their rivals, much as Europeans did, right? And to their own detriment. They'll wipe out beaver populations, they'll wipe out human populations that they're enslaving, they'll wipe out elephant populations, right? The, the arms trade is another similar parallel. Um, I, and I, I would love to see the literature start to draw those connections uh, more robustly than it does now. To what extent were um, was the American government sort of fomenting this kind of interest in the <laughs> um, So the, one, the way that um, aggravated military men more than anything else is that the government would sign peace treaties or land session treaties or peace and land session treaties with native people and um, would promise them annuities, right? So annual payments in exchange for keeping the peace or selling the land. Those annuities very often took the form of guns, powder, and shot. And you, you have these, um, these military men who are writing, writing to Congress saying, I'm tired of my, of my men being shot at with guns that we recover on the field that bear, bear serial numbers for the U.S. Armory. Stop doing this. And what, what, you know, what, these, um, what these agents in the field who have a much more nuanced sense of diplomacy um, say is, well, I know that's bad, but it's even worse if we don't arm them. Because at least they're sometimes keeping the peace. They're sometimes not attacking their tribal rivals. Um, and so, you know, on a sliding scale, this is the best deal that, that we can cut. 
Um, so I think that's the most glaring example of the sort. Um, another example would come from the removed tribes, um, uh, removed by the Jackson administration, Van Buren administrations, uh, to Oklahoma. Part of what many people uh, don't realize is they actually received, I, I think they would have uh, rather have kept the land in the, in the southeast, but they did, they were compensated by the government um, for this. And one of the ways in which they were compensated were with cutting arms firearms technology. So they show up uh, in, in Oklahoma armed to the teeth with rifles, um, which are especially... Uh, useful on the plains, right? Because you have these wide open uh, ranges. They're not so great in, in the eastern woodlands, but they, they're terrific on, on the plains. And, and groups like, like the Cherokees and, and, and the Creeks and the Seminoles um, are the terror of some of these plains tribes early on. Because Eventually what they do is they become the middlemen. They start trading the rifles to groups like the Comanches and the Kiowas, Cheyennes, um, um, and the like. So, yeah, the, uh, the U.S. government is implicated in a, a lot of these developments. But not by strategy to kill each other off. Oh, no. No, 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 no certainly not. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I think that the notion that any of these colonial powers, including the United States, has control over these situations, would, it, that's, not, that's just not true. Not control. Yeah, no, I understand. I, I've seen I've seen nothing in the historical record that that would suggest as such. Um, you know, I think maybe the the only such example, and I think it was an ineffective strategy, um, is the French are are doing their best to keep the Choctaws and the Chickasaws um, in the early 18th century um, fighting each other, and they're they're plying the Choctaws with arms to try to encourage them to attack Chickasaws. So what they say is, if these two groups um, make peace with each other, they'll probably fall under the influence of the English and then um, uh, turn their aggression against French Louisiana. Um, but I think the notion that the French are directing Choctaw military um, uh, strategy um, vastly exaggerates the influence of, of the French. Uh, no question. Yep. But then also, they, uh, they, uh, when they get guns, they become an expert at the things that we bring to them and better than we were. Absolutely. The other thing is, it uh, seems like in Afghanistan, we're using other tribes to help us at times when we need to. There's sort of a similarity. Mm -hmm. One tribe in this. Yeah. The Northern Alliance against the Taliban. Right. Right. Um, it's um, wonderful to read these accounts of American military officers marveling at native equestrian and gun skills on the plane. You know, what they say is, you know, these guys can ride the horse with no hands, duck under the neck of the horse, and fire accurately while riding at full speed. You know, meanwhile, they have these... these Cavalry men from Connecticut, right? <laughs> like they, they don't they can't they can't grasp any of this. Um, it's well, and, and, and likewise, likewise. Um, you know, it, uh, if 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 it's a fair fight, same number of men, uh, you Plains tribes still hold their land today. It's not a fair fight. Uh, they're they are swarmed by. Yeah, look, I'll give you give you an example. Of what I mean by by swarming. Second Seminole War. In the 1830s, Seminoles hold off the United States for seven years, right? Um, at the cost of I can't remember I can't remember the exact cost of the war, but in today's dollar I think today's dollars it would run in the hundreds um, hundreds of billions of dollars. There were only 4,000 Seminoles. The size of the United States at that time is 19 million people. <laughs> it's, again, it's not a it's not a fair fight, and they're still putting up a good fight. Hey, I was struck by your comment that you haven't come across any that's actually manufacturing firearms. Right. Are you, is this perhaps because your point is that you know, they really they were getting plenty of firearms through trade? There was just never really a need to manufacture firearms. It was just a, a lack of weapons was never really a threat. I think there's two points. Um, here, One, th they do not have the industrial capacity to manufacture firearms. I, you you need to have mining technology, and you also have to have a 
a uh, population of wage workers who are willing to do that kind of miserable work. And Native society is not organized that way. Uh, people would tell you to go boo if you, if you go down in a mine. Now, come on, uh, this is not going to happen. Um, you have to have people who are exploitable um, to do that kind of terrible work. But I, your second point, I think, is, is uh, uh, worth elaborating on here. For many Native people, one of the symbols of their sovereignty was forcing colonial powers to provide them with free blacksmithing. And if you go through, if you go through native, native treaty conferences, this is very often point number one of, of negotiations. We want you to send us a blacksmith. And the, colon, and the colonial powers almost across the board do it at no charge. Not only that, the, the blacksmiths themselves very often are willing to work with, for no salary because living in a native village puts them in a prime position to get the very best furs. In, in the trade. So, you know, location, 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 um, right? Um, I, uh, Native people also um, work out these deals with colonial powers that when we're passing through an area, and if you have a fort, we're going to stop in, you're going to fix all our guns, and you're going to provide us with powder and shot. Happens all the time. And it's, a con it's rent. It's rent. Um, yeah, Native people... Native people don't see what's coming down the pike, and how could they possibly have, right? Um, what they're trying, very often, what, we too often cast colonial America as an invasion from Europe. It's not, I understand the point in the long term. In the short term, that is not how it worked. Many Native people saw an advantage of having a small number of Europeans stationed in their territory so they could get the trade, they could form military alliances, um, and, and the like. It later becomes a swarming. They can't see that coming coming down the pike again. Yeah. So, in terms of the native polities and the balance of power in intertribal warfare, when some ascended and became sort of a power, did they amass a certain land control and integrate their subjugated tribes into theirs, and then go out? Yeah, um, you know, so m m most of these uh, these groups that I've highlighted becoming ascendant. Um, one of the sources of their power is absorbing other peoples, usually cap usually women and children who they've captured from from their enemies, um, and that's the only way that they can maintain and even grow their populations during a period of time in which a epidemic diseases are sweeping off staggering numbers of people, and in which B, intertribal warfare is so ubiquitous and deadly that that's carrying off large numbers of, of men on, on a regular basis. Um, so yes, I mean, that's how they go about doing this. You know, sometimes these expanding groups will um, subjugate another people and then set up a tributary relationship with them, right, in which they're, 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 you know, they're the subjugated group is kicking up to the, the stronger, uh, stronger party. More often, though, it's the absorption of other people that's the aim of, of these ascendant groups. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, although, <laughs> let me say this. Um, I think there is a uh, mistaken notion in the literature, the historical literature, that native ambush tactics are an outgrowth of the adoption of firearms. I don't know how a historian could possibly know that, since there are no, almost no historical records of these groups before the introduction of firearms. And it seems it, entirely contrary to everything that I've seen in, in the history of Native America that they weren't launching these kinds of ambushes before they acquired guns. I will concede that there are, there are about two anecdotes of open field battles involving Native people 
um, from uh, the 16th and 17th century. And I really mean that's about it. From that, those anecdotes, historians have created this schema in which those open field battles were the normal form of native warfare until the invention of guns. And then these, uh, you know, these ambush tactics became predominant. We have no way of knowing that. But, though it stands to reason that standing in an open field and getting shot at uh, was not something that was particularly appealing to them. You can get soldiers in Europe to do that, again, because of the hierarchical organization of society. No native warrior is going to do that because someone told them to. That is not how native society worked. Um, it's much more egalitarian um, that way, or anarchic, however you want to um, style it. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, uh, the, these guns are more lethal than the weapons that they had before. They are emboldening certain groups to go out and conquer others. Other groups are acquiring these guns and going to war to protect themselves against these expansionist groups. Um, you take guns out of the equation, I can't see how the southeastern Indian slave trade um, grows to the extent that it did. So yeah, I, I, I would see this as a military revolution, for sure. We have time for one more. Jacob? So, I was wondering, you mentioned in your book that the Pacific Northwest uh, Native Americans conflict with the colonial powers was a huge battle of proportions and everything. So, mm -hmm. Is there any other type of gun trade going on in that region, or is that just one that you highlighted because of its importance? And so, in the up until uh, about seven, oh, until Captain Cook's voyage, um, uh, you know, in the late 18th century, I would characterize the Pacific Northwest, you know, by which by which I mean, uh, you know, Oregon, Washington, uh, British Columbia, uh, Panhandle of Alaska, as among one of the most isolated places on the face of the globe. Um, it's not that the native people didn't have relationships with other native people at long distances, but most other people around the globe had uh, contact with overseas foreigners. They didn't, except for every once in a while a Spanish ship would, would get blown off course, and, but that's about it. Almost overnight, because of the voyages of James Cook and the publication of his journals, which include this point that, oh, we acquired otter pelts there and the Chinese love them. They will pay top dollar for them. All of a sudden, ships from half a dozen nations overnight are anchored off of these shores. Um, and again, some of these chiefs are cornering, cornering the market. That's the only access they have to these arms. They, uh, you know, there's no Euro-American settlements within range of these, these people. Now, that would change um, in, in a matter of decades, but not, not at that point, no. That's, that's it. Um, and, you know, I think and it's, it's worth illustrating the point this way, too. What those groups tended to do is hunt out their otter population, right? Yeah. Um, the otter are very slow to reproduce. When they did that, the ships stopped coming. And then these groups, <laughs> which have been antagonizing their neighbors because of their advantage in arms, don't have them anymore. I want to know what happened. The problem, though is that the ship sailed off, and so did the records. So I can guess <laughs> what happened, um, but I don't know for certain. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.